everyone. So we're going to get started here. Welcome to the 2003 Flood Mitigation Plan update. My name is Amalia Pleaktam. I'm an environmental planner with Calvert County Planning and Zoning. I'm part of the team here updating our plan. You can just go down the line and introduce the rest of us. We are an inter interdepartmental plan, so we have folks from different departments joining us to work and make this plan a great recipe for success. Kevin, do you want to start? Hello, I'm Kevin Shaver. I'm a project engineer with Capital Projects Division of DPW Public Works. Hi, I'm Sierra Newsom. I'm uh, the Public Safety GIS Analyst. Kara Buckmaster, Emergency Management Specialist. I'm Adam Leister. I'm a Senior GIS Consultant and um, Hazard Mitigation Consultant with MCM Consulting Group uh, Incorporated. Um, we're brought in to assist with the actual update of the plan, the drafting, um, GIS work that might need to be done as well. Um, so I'm happy to be here and to see everyone's uh, smiling faces. And I am Ronald Marney. I am Calvert County's Environmental Planning Regulator and Floodplain Administrator. Great. So first we're just going to have Adam walk us through what is a flood mitigation plan, the process, what data sources do we use, just so we have a little broad brush understanding of, of what we're doing here tonight. Um, and then we're going to go through and just kind of look at the, the history of the feedback that we've gotten from the public in, in prior iterations of this, and then hear your concerns. Adam? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we'll get into some of the slides here that we put together. Um, and the first one is just a very brief um, understanding of why is a flood mitigation plan necessary. Um, from a hazard mitigation perspective, um, all local jurisdictions, um, be it at the county level, are um, empowered by the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000, uh, which amended the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act. Um, to update hazard mitigation planning and a flood mitigation plan is part of a hazard mitigation planning mechanism. So the flood mitigation plan here at Calvert County um, is necessary to identify where specific flooding um, issues have occurred in the past, um, determine these flooding issues and how they can be mitigated, um, increase the resiliency of a local jurisdiction, county or area, um, against flooding and to identify where changes in a local jurisdiction or an area uh, may affect flooding. So what kind of developments are going on in the county as a whole, in the town centers, in the incorporated municipalities, and things like that. And uh, flood mitigation plans can be updated. Um, as Amalia mentioned at the top of the meeting, this is actually an update to your current uh, flood mitigation plan that's in place. Um, so a flood mitigation plan should be updated on a regular, on, on a regular schedule um, just like a hazard mitigation plan um, to make sure that it's being um, analyzed, it's being looked at, it's being changed for different aspects that might change in a jurisdiction or the county itself. Um, so it's a, it's a living document. We don't want the flood mitigation plan to go up on a shelf and not be touched until it's ready to be updated. We want to make sure that it's a living document and best represents Calvert County, local jurisdictions, and you, the public, as to what's going on and uh, how flooding can affect you your property, your local jurisdiction, your incorporated municipality, wherever you're from in the county. Uh, so uh, just to highlight some of the data sources that we're currently in the middle of using for the update process, um, we're using a lot of National Weather Service data to make sure that we get the most up-to-date published data for precipitation. That includes um, snowfall, rainfall, things like that, hail. Um, we're also using the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's data tools um, the uh, NOAA provides a lot of great information from their National Centers for Environmental Information, which is all open source and able to be used, and uh, storm events databases for past storm events. Um, that's limited only by um, what data is put in there, so it covers hurricanes, flash flooding, flooding, um, major um, other flooding events that might have impacted the county um, that are put into that database. Um, we're going to discuss MyCoast a little later on in the presentation, but that's something that we're going to use to solicit um, some information from and to look at for data sources. Um, and other Calvert County planning documents, um, including but not limited to the Calvert County Hazard Mitigation Plan, um, your previous Hazard Mitigation Plan, and the one that is currently um, being reviewed, um, the previous Calvert County Flood Mitigation Plan, and uh, Calvert County GIS data, and any other Calvert County planning mechanisms um, that are related to flooding um, that we have access to. So with, with those general data sources, and there are a few others that aren't called out specifically on that slide, uh, we get a good understanding of what past flooding events have occurred in Calvert County, um, what the situation is that led to those past flooding events, uh, where they've occurred, what the magnitude was, 
Um, the National Weather Service and the National Center for Environmental Information also publish um, estimated damage losses for those events too, so we get a basic understanding of that as well. Um, but there's another tool that we're going to discuss in just a few slides that also touches on damage estimates. So we'll continue on here. So developing the flood mitigation plan um, is a process. Um, it's not done in, in one go. There are certain steps to it, different parts of the plan that are um, determined and um, processed at different times. So the first item is a data analysis, and that looks at all past uh, flooding, flash flooding, and other flooding events like nuisance flooding that might have occurred in Calvert County. Um, it also looks at past precipitation and uh, data related to rainfall and snow data, and it looks at areas of development that might have occurred in Calvert County since the previous flood mitigation plan. It also looks at areas of past flooding um, occurrence, and uh, we also take a look at hazards, which is another thing we're going to talk about in a uh, slide or two. Um, once we do the data analysis, that gives us a good idea of where the flooding is the most problematic, where we need to look at for mitigation, and where we can reduce the vulnerability of Calvert County to those flooding actions. And uh, we'll actually do a mitigation action review from your other planning mechanisms. We'll look at all the goals, objectives, actions that are in all other planning mechanisms related to flooding for Calvert County, and we'll provide updates, recommendations, and ways to improve or to better understand those mitigation actions to make sure that they are living and breathing in other planning mechanisms throughout the county. Uh, one item we always like to cover here on this slide is that input from the public is crucial to the development of this plan. You have the most up-to-date info as to where specific flooding issues are occurring. Um, you can tell us where, you can tell us what, you can tell us how, you can tell us what the magnitude is. Um, so public information on past flooding and flash flooding locations um, will tailor the plan to meet your local needs as well as the needs of the county as a whole. So uh, continuing on with some development of flood mitigation plans, um, what's HAZUS? So I mentioned earlier that uh, we are going to use some other tools to determine um, damage estimates uh, based on different scenarios. So HAZUS is a tool that FEMA puts out that can be integrated into GIS um, and is used for estimating loss related to specific hazard events based on the um, magnitude of a flooding event. What we're using it for this process for Calvert County, we're doing it both for coastal and riverine flooding. So um, we're making sure that it's as comprehensive as it can be when we're looking at Calvert County as a whole. And uh, there are different ways to do a hazard scenario. Um, one of the major ones is a countywide scenario. So that looks at the county as a whole with a specific set of parameters. Um, for the initial one that we ran, it was for a 100-year um, flood occurrence event. Um, and that was for the whole county. So we had that info come in, and then we start by breaking that down then by census track level, so we get a more localized idea of where that's occurring within the county. Um, so that's going to provide some of that local data that then we can use to supplement what you provide us from your local knowledge of what's going on. Um, Hazus is a great tool. Um, it provides a lot of great information related to sp uh, potential losses that are related to vehicles, buildings, uh, different types of structures how much displacement is going to occur in a specific area for debris and things like that. So when we look at both the county and then each census track level, we get a better understanding of what's potential to be impacted and to uh, create damage. And uh, mitigation action review, um, this is going to be used to determine where each mitigation action is in related to uh, flooding. Um, and uh, that's just going to be another discussion of what the status is with the planning team. Um, with the owners of those specific mitigation action um, items from other planning mechanisms. And that's going to just provide a status update on all those actions and goals as to has there been progress, is there no progress, is it currently being done, or is it completed? And if we determine that some mitigation actions might be completed, we can look at developing new mitigation actions for this flood mitigation plan that could then be integrated into your hazard mitigation plan the next time that is up for um, an update or during an annual review process. So everything kind of builds off of each other, and this is one aspect of hazard mitigation that we want to cover specifically related to flooding. Uh, we're also going to look at countywide actions versus actions for individual jurisdictions, and uh, we're going to look at um, potential images and pictures related to those actions that can update the status. So if we go out there and we see that a potential mitigation action has been completed, we can update the plan with pictures of that mitigation action being completed, and include that in the plan. I think that covers most of my items for the first part of this, so I will turn it over to Amalia. Thank you, Adam.
So that's an overview of the mitigation plan update process. We lasted this process in 2016. That draft did not get um, adopted by the BOCC. But during that process, we solicited feedback from the public. And so I'm just going to walk you through a couple of the feedback points that we got um, just as a starting point um, as we solicit feedback for this um, iteration. So there are a few flood prone areas in Calvert County, um, Burns Island, Cove Point, Breezy Point, near the states, Plum Point. Um, Chesapeake Beach and North Beach, however, those are municipalities, um, so they're welcome to join our, to adopt our flood plan, um, but we will not be addressing those communities in this meeting tonight. So um, with Brooms Island, it is a low-lying area with a high water table. A lot of the structures there were built prior to the 1985 stormwater management requirements. Um, so the public concerns with um, Brooms Island, sea level rise and land subsidence, um, there's nuisance flooding when there's heavy precipitation or prolonged storm events, um, and that is exacerbated by high tides. There are um, low-lying areas adjacent to the wetlands that are, uh, that are prone to flooding. Um, and the properties on Songbird Lane, Brooms Island Road, and Oyster House Road tend to flood even during just regular high tides. So those were the concerns for Brooms Island. Moving on to Cove Point. Oops. Cove Point, again, you're looking at an area with low-lying land and high water tables. Um, it sits on a sand spit, so that sandy soil is difficult to work with, especially um, when dealing with successful stormwater management. Um, and again, those structures were built prior to the 1985 stormwater management re requirements. Um, the public feedback with Cove Point, again, sea level rise and then land subsidence, um, nuisance flooding or tidal flooding. So when I say nuisance flooding, that's synonymous with tidal flooding. Um, I think tidal flooding is probably an easier term to, um, uh, to understand because nuisance flooding can, can um, you know, if you just have a heavy rainfall and it comes into your basement steps, right, that could be a nuisance. So, so tidal flooding is a concern with Coke Point as well. Um, Coke Point Road, the entrance <coughs> to the community floods during heavy precipitation and prolonged storm events. Um, and those were the main concerns. And again, the low-lying um, wetlands were prone to flooding as well. So those were the main concerns with Cove Point. And Breezy Point, Neal the State's Plum Point, um, again, low-lying land, high water table. Uh, there you're looking at shoreline erosion as well um, and storm surges. The public feedback there, again, sea level rise and land subsidence, that was public feedback across the board. Um, so there, were, there was interest in sewer service feasibility. Um, there was concern about failing sep septic systems and small lot sizes and how that would affect property values and, and lowering property values. So that was the feedback we got last time. That's just to kind of prime your pump, shall we say, for feedback for this time. Um, and before we get into hearing from you and where you live and your concerns, I did just want to highlight um, a tool that we're using in, in Calvert County. It's called MyCoast. Maryland. It is a statewide tool, and at the, t at the front there are flyers for MyCoast. It has a QR code that you can pop up on your phone. You do need to log in and create an account so you can upload pictures of flooding. Now those photos are helpful for us and the state of Maryland because they help us track flooding trends. You can also upload historical photos. So if you had a flood from in, you know, 95 or 2002, you can upload them some of those older photos you might have to manually add the date, but that allows the state of Maryland and other researchers to track the flooding trends. It also allows emergency response to identify roads that are flooding if it's happening currently during that, during that event. Um, so if you go onto that website and search Calvert, thank you, Terrell, um, you, you create an account and you go in and you search for reports and if you um, select Calvert along the side here, you'll see we currently have 94 reports. And so all of those reports, somebody has uploaded those photos. Um, and then if you click on the photo, it will give you the time, the title search, various data like that. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting photo and again, or tool. And again, it's just amazing that they can take showing the water levels during those events and, and, and using that to give us even an even richer data set to um, to help us plan and, and see how the flood trends are, are happening in, in Calvert County. So that's an overview of our process. Do we have any questions or concerns about the process before we just hear about where you're from and your, and your flooding concerns? 
Bob? So um, you talked about having local data, but how local is it? I mean, is it data that's actually taken on site, say in Calvert County in some place? For which, for, well, th with the data sets, there's a variety of data sets. So some of it is sure. state, some of it is national. Yeah, so, so with the National Weather Service and NOAA, it's from um, <coughs> observation points for uh, rain collection, for precipitation specifically, and for snowfall. So it's not specifically related to like individual addresses per se, not down to the house. Um, it's related to the weather stations that are within or in some cases around Calvert County to get a more regional look at it as well. Um, there, are, there are sites around like Coco Ross you're probably familiar with. Yep. That are, um, and uh, if we look at some of the GIS data that we provided or that we were provided with, some of that's based on some previous instances of public coming forward with specific issues. So um, some of the GIS data we've been provided at the flooding level has been areas of previous local concern. So that point, it, it is very local. It's not just regional of here's where the GIS data issues are coming from. It's it's here's where the issue was, here's what the issue was at the time. So um, with those two data sets, that's kind of where it sits. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and also with the MyCoast data, the, the reports, well, when you click on the report, it shows where that photo was uploaded from. So that, it, you know, which area within Calvert County. Any other questions about the process or data? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Rick Tom. Oh, hi, Rick. Nice to meet you. Yeah, we, it would seem that um, there could be lots of holes in the data, i.e. that you really do need to rely on input from local neighborhoods. So, um, uh, first of all, is that, I mean, is that, is it safe, is it safe to say that you could use a lot more input from people that are sitting in this room about the particular problems that affect their neighborhood? Well, so I won't speak to the modeling and the data modeling, but um, it, is, it, is, it is accurate to say that, you know, the citizens are the ones who are experiencing the flooding. Are they, are they impacting your roads? Are they impacting critical infrastructure? Is it impacting your properties? So that feedback, it, yes, that is coming from you to augment the data and the modeling that our um, technicians are, are providing for us. But I am not the GIS data expert, so I'll let um, yeah, and, and, and I'll also defer to uh, Sierra as well um, for any GIS discussions. But from my perspective, any info we can get is going to be good information that's going to then provide it to make it more of a locally um, applicable plan, if that makes sense. So I, I would never discourage more involvement with getting us data sources and things like that, but, but I also do want to defer to um, the county as well for GIS discussions. Can can I also just add, Rick, I think you're asking specifically about flooding in Neal to States, correct? Correct. So what I would recommend is to use the MyCoast app, and if you guys, which I'm sure you guys do, have a pretty accurate log of flooding incidences in that community, go on to MyCoast and try and upload as many of those as you can. If you can attach photos to them, the more information we have, the better. And that's for the flood mitigation plan, that's for emergency response and planning. Across the board, more data is always better. So all of that information that you guys have can help us tailor the flood mitigation plan and future actions and updates to more specifically meet your need. Yeah, thanks, Kara. I mean, I, the good news is we've got one, two, there's, there's five of us here from the community, although I would say that uh, I'm not sure how many, how many of these folks are actually upload stuff to my coast on a routine base, and I'd say, in general, residents in our neighborhood aren't doing that, and you just kind of reaffirm, reaffirm what I thought was the case. I mean, if we're not doing that, you know, this plan isn't gonna accurately reflect the problems, the extent of the problems, which then sort of leads to my, my, my bigger question is, you know, kind of how do you, how do you prioritize things? So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna produce a plan. How do you prioritize where county money is gonna go to address problems? I mean, assuming that's it's assuming 
th there's money that will flow at some point for problems that appear to be persistent, you know, uh, greater impact, uh, you know. I'll touch on the first and the second question a little bit and then pass it on not down the line. So I don't, I can, cannot just uh, say enough how important it is to have public involvement, but I also do not want to discount the quality of the data. So when you're talking about like inundation modeling and things like that, our, our high resolution LIDAR data is accurate to within three centimeters and it is local data. So I don't want you to think that you're not going to have a good analysis, but absolutely that does not decrease the value of any input from the public. I just don't want you to think that you're not going to get a good product. Uh, as far as what the document's going to result in down the line, this is going to be a guiding policy document similar to our comprehensive plan, our disaster, our all county has mitigation plan. This is going to give us direction and possible ways to approach things. It's not necessarily going to allocate funds, but it's going to let us know where the problems are, the severity of the problems, and possible ways we can look at solutions in the future. I'm sorry, just uh, for the, our, our friends online, um, I'm going to ask folks to come to the microphone and, and talk so they can hear us. Apologies. Um, but yes, so. Thank, uh, thanks, Kara. Thanks, Ron. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate the responses. Any other questions or concerns? Yes, Bob. Please, yeah, please. Thank you. I'll try to set a trend here. <laughs> Not meaning that I talk too much, but <laughs> uh, you talked a lot about um, uh, rainfall, but I'm fascinated by subsidence as well, and I, I'd like to hear a little more about subsidence and are you modeling it? How are you using it? How are you getting the data? Is it a problem? That sort of thing, stuff. Yeah, so uh, just from the perspective of um, hazard mitigation. Um, we are looking at other hazards that can be related to flooding and subsidence is one of them. Um, it's covered in your hazard mitigation plan, so we're gonna use that as um, kind of a basis um, as we start to look at how that's gonna be impacted. So, so yeah, we'll discuss subsidence and how it's related. Um, we won't necessarily do a whole lot of, of modeling per se, um, right out of the box, um, but we'll discuss kind of where subsidence is going to uh, relate to flooding. Um, and past occurrences and things like that. So um, I, I think to address your concern, yes, it'll, it'll be addressed as how flooding relates to other hazards, but it, it won't necessarily be modeled per se. I'll just repeat it for the folks. Okay, so um, one member of the public just asked about Solomon's area. Um, that is another area of, of flooding. Um, I was not present. Yeah. We have specialized plans that focus in on smaller areas, and the county-wide plan obviously would not ignore Solomon's either. So I, I don't, again, I don't want you to think that any community, just because it's not specifically called out, just because your neighbor is not specifically called out in this, uh, this uh, meeting or your uh, town center, we're looking at the entirety of the county. This is the county-wide flood mitigation plan, and we will be looking at the hazards for all of our residents. So am I in the wrong meeting? No, ma'am, you're in the right meeting. <laughs> so DPW is familiar with Charles Street flooding especially, um, and we are looking at modifying the storm drain system to help prevent the high tide water from coming back up into the storm drain uh, system down there. And that's, that's usually the cause of the flooding on Charles Street. So that is something we are looking at. I think, Amalia, you alluded to the fact that uh, the previous flood mitigation plan had not been approved by the BOCC. Yes, that, sir. So what, I mean, what's actually the implications of a plan not being approved? And this plan that's going to be published, right? What do you, what do you got? What do you have to do to get it approved? Okay. Well, touch on what happened. Sure. All right. So that not being adopted was simply a process error. It, it, the plan is intended to be adopted with the all hazard mitigation plan, which is why we are having it back in lockstep with that, because that plan is about done, we are starting this plan so that they will be back in sync. So 
what happened is when that went to the BOCC, it simply wasn't included with it and they weren't adopted at the same time. So again, that it's not that the document had no value or that there was any opposition or anything like that. That simply, that, that step in the process didn't occur as it was supposed to. But again, we had the data and we obviously utilized that and gener used that, applied that towards a lot of things. Like if you've fun, been following our uh, zoning ordinance update, you'll see some amendments that we made there to the uh, flood ordinance. And we have a question from online, Monique Will Wheeler. Uh, Hi, uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you for uh, hosting this for all of us. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I have been in emergency management for the last years and, have, and teach hazard mitigation at Georgetown. So a couple items, um, I'm a resident at Cove Point, um, and a couple items that I would uh, like some clarification on is is there any um, coordination with uh, Parks and Rec? Uh, near Cove Point, there is a park that would be a, a wonderful solution for short-term um, or temporary um, uh, hazards, emergencies, warnings, et cetera, for residents, especially vulnerable populations within the Cove Point community where travel is, um, is difficult and was wondering if you were coordinating or, um, or uh, working with um, any other county agencies in terms of increase of uh, short-term evacuation. For, for, for that. Okay. Hi, again, this is Kara Buckmaster, Emergency Management Specialist for Calvert County. Um, Yes, your, the short answer is yes. We do work very closely with several other departments and offices throughout the county. For the recent All Hazards Mitigation Plan update, that definitely included Parks and Rec. It also included planning and zoning. It included public works, and it included community resources and economic development. I could continue to go on. So we do make try to ensure that with both the hazard mitigation plan and the flood mitigation plan, we are taking an interdisciplinary approach to cover all of our stakeholders and partners that need to be involved in this process. Um, as far as the park and evacuations, I think that strongly depends on the hazard and the threat that is presented. Um, we do work in emergency management to maintain our com community alerting systems. So if there is an evacuation that's needed due to um, severe weather, that is something we work with them on to provide, ti provide timely notification. If you're referring to something more severe, such as the nuclear power plant, that follows a completely separate process. Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to our office if you have more questions about that. I'd be happy to connect you with our other planners in emergency management to address that more specifically. Does that answer your question? It does, and I have two other questions before I am done, I promise. Um, with this uh, revision of the uh, hazard mitigation uh, plan, are you all or is Calvert County considering um, any kind of FEMA uh, mitigation, hazard mitigation, or flooding mitigation grants? Are those on the docket or will this information be feeding into any of that? I'll take that one again. Uh, yes, so <laughs> I am our hazard mitigation grant program manager. And so we uh, manage all of the HMA grants that come through Calvert County with the exception of the FMA grant that was used to help fund this update that ran through environmental planning specifically. But um, so the new hazard mitigation plan is currently with FEMA under review. We're hoping to have that approved back from FEMA at the beginning of January and then um, that does capture several project opportunities in there, and we have several dozen mitigation actions that are linked to those project opportunities. We also, as I mentioned, we work with Public Works. We've had discussions about project opportunities, and my office manages the mitigation grants for residential elevations and acquisitions also. So we have several cliff houses that were recently funded. We have several flood acquisitions and elevations that are currently funded, and we've begun some conversation about some larger community-wide mitigation projects, but we're not currently pursuing any for fiscal year 2023 funding. 
And if I can just add on to what Kara said, um, after a tropical storm, Issa Zayas, uh, one of her co-workers, Barbara Warner, and I worked very closely together for three years to uh, get back about a little over $6 million out of the $7 million worth of damage that Calvert County sustained. And a lot of that was classified by FEMA as hazard uh, mitigation. Um, so rather than just putting the dirt back on the hillside, we made sure that dirt would never come back again. Um, so they were, they were not the easiest group to work with, but we eventually uh, were able to, to push through and get a lot of those projects built back better. So. Thank you, I appreciate it. On behalf of everyone who's on the line and in person, the, the data is remarkable. So I, I have a lot of faith in the data collection and the analysis, so I appreciate you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions online or in the room? Concerns? Observations? Yes, ma'am. Um, so my question is, I've lived only 12 years in Neal State, but it floods every year. Um, and so what, what needs to be done by us, what needs to be done by you in order to um, solve the problem? It takes a combined effort. So you have to understand, like, this document will not magically alleviate these programs or all the problems that this have, but it's going to give us guidance to make them better. So we won't be able to flood-proof Calvert County, but we can absolutely mitigate that hazard because that's what this is, a hazard that we're looking to mitigate. So it's going to be working on our level to continue grants. It's going to be keeping these documents and these data sets constantly up to date. And it's going to be assisting the public with different grant opportunities to mitigate the hazards on their specific properties. All things that we are doing, but we are going to continue to do and hopefully continue to do better to help you. So when could we expect some help? Have you applied for on one of our hazard mitigation grants through FEMA? I can speak to that a little bit. I've had conversations with Rick, I believe we spoke about it, and also John about it. Um, the shoreline project for Neal Estates is certainly a very um, impressive project that would be palatable to FEMA for mitigation funding. The issue that comes with that is the non-federal cost share, and currently the county is not in a position to allocate county funds, public funds for private property mitigation. That is one of the uh, hurdles we're trying to work around. So we discussed as one of the potential solutions a special tax district specifically for Neal Estates so that the residents could combine their resources to provide that cost share and pursue the grant. But we have to have that commitment up front before we pursue the grant. Additionally, with the creation of that special task, tax district, that also is acknowledging the problem in such a way that it still needs to be addressed with or without grant funding. So for the residents of Neal Estates, that can be very difficult if a $2 million project that they're expecting to pay 25% of turns into 100%. Um, I also know that one of the issues has been with the DNR grant and with the FEMA grants, the timeline, FEMA's hazard mitigation, assistance program works very, very slow. From the time that we start an application um, in August of one year, it's usually almost two years before we get to actual funding award and project kickoff. So it's a very slow burn, it's a, it's a difficult process. For, and and it's, it's kind of intentionally set that way because FEMA's trying to be very diligent with how they're allocating this funding. So. I think that is a very long, co difficult conversation that ex exceeds the scope of this meeting. Um, but again, I'm happy to speak with you all more about it. Uh, we also have Stacy in my office, who's our mitigation specialist, and I know she's been in contact with some of you. We work very closely with environmental planning on these issues too, and with public works. And so it's not like we're trying to ignore the problem. We know it's there. We talk a lot about it, and we're also as public servants, very interested in finding solutions. It's just cutting through 
those those other hurdles, getting across those big hurdles, which takes time and a lot of planning. And it would take a, also a very large community effort from the United States alongside our work. But I guess I'm, I'm referring more to just the flooding in the neighborhood, not necessarily, yes, we have severe shoreline erosion, and but this is just, it, it rained on Sunday. <clears throat> and certain yards and you know, homes that were flooded you know garages crawl spaces um, were flooded now some people say the roads are built too high because they kept layering them and therefore the water runs off goes into the yards but you know um, so yeah so just just flooding from raining nothing to do with necessarily shoreline but what can we do or what can the county do about just heavy rain and then we flood? So as far as the upland flooding goes, is what I refer to as is upland flooding, um, we are addressing any of the water that's coming off the roadways and going into mm -hmm. people's properties and flooding their, their homes. Um, Mr. Plitt has a set of plans with him that I gave him tonight um, to address some concerns along Ridge Road and Bay Boulevard. I'm not exactly sure where you live in the, in the community. I live on Beach Drive. Beach Drive? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can take a look at that. As I talked to Mr. Collins the other day, you know, with their grant application, they're looking at a holistic approach to solving flooding within a community. And so we are trying to solve the upland flooding as well as take care of the, the tidal flooding component. So I'll add beach uh, to the list. Yeah, and see I, what actually, we can do I there. don't have much flooding. I'm speaking more of my neighbors like Mike and mm -hmm. um, John Norris and some of the other neighbors that have severe flooding. In their yards. Okay. Yeah. Just so when it rains. Right. So those were aware Not, of that. Nothing to do with a storm per se, but just heavy rains. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, like Thank I say, we, we've come up with plans. Um, we're just looking for funding to actually do construction. Construction. Mm -hmm. um, we had hoped to use. I have a fund that I I can use for what's called MS4 credit, dealing with stormwater management. Unfortunately, with that particular project, we just weren't going to get much bang for the buck uh, doing MS4. So I have to look for alternative funding mm -hmm. uh, to, for construction. So. Okay, but, thank you. Yep. Hi, I live in the old estate as well. I'm on Bay Parkway, and I'm on the corner of Bay Boulevard and Bay Parkway. So with the rain, the problem is the flooding into the yards from the rain coming down the hill, and there's a lot more paved driveways now. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. allowed anymore, but that's... Everyone seems to be doing that up along that area from Ridge Road, Bay Parkway, Bay Boulevard. So it comes down, I get three times the amount of rain that comes down, it just rolls down the hill. There was drainage on Bay Boulevard and that the county had done probably 10 years ago. And since then it's all sunk and it's not helping. So that was a good yeah. area for the water accumulate and keep it from rolling down. My biggest concern is my septic field because my ground has sunk. I've been in the estate for 19 years. So I've probably, the ground's probably sunk a foot at this point. So I'm trying to preserve the septic. You may be aware of all the septic issues <laughs> in the old estate and I'm trying to preserve what I have. So I don't have to pay an extra amount of money for that to deal with that. So uh, the county could help uh, I don't know what they can do for drainage, but I think as a short-term solution, they could at least work the area that was worked previously. Mm -hmm. That would contain some of the water right there. Yeah, I know some of those pipes have gotten clogged over the years and require us to go down there and clean them out. Um, yeah, there so was like a deep trench, and then a lot of rocks were put into that. I don't know about the drainage any more than that, but I've gotten... I guess three years ago when we had that heavy tornado hurricane event, I had 32 inches of water under my house. So it just poured in there. So I've, I've taken some measures, try to prevent it from going under the crawl space, I blocked the crawl space. But every rain, like the one Sunday, I had a foot of rain in the yard. So the ground is sunk just from the volume of rain coming down the hill. So part of my area is up high enough the driveway, but everywhere else on the bayfront side and all around so the septic field, <laughs> that's my biggest concern, along with everything else that the neighborhood is uh, concerned about. But it, it blocks, the water covers the road, bay 
boulevard gets covered with water and when people drive through it, it just floods right into my yard makes it worse so I was trying to find other mitigating factors like putting a wall up but the county didn't allow that because where's the water gonna go it's like I don't care get it out of my yard <laughs> so you know I don't know uh, we need help on that so I'm not sure what the solution would be but just want you to be aware okay thank you that. thank you I did want to add for some of these questions on individual properties, those FEMA hazard mitigation grants are not just for the stormwater or for shore erosion. You can do, I believe as Kara mentioned, elevations. Again, you would still need that 25% match, but that is something I really encourage the public to either communicate with us or to research on your own. That's a really good resource to help uh, protect and mitigate your property. Uh, regarding the septic, the Bay Restoration Fund grants are another good option to look at too, specifically for that feature of your property. But by all means, whenever you have these questions or concerns, we'll do our best to help you find something to help. Um, yeah, so Amalia, the, the email that I sent you yesterday that had a bunch of pictures. Yes, sir. All right, and uh, a bunch of pictures that should be on my coast, right? They will, they will, they will make their way there, but also in that package. And this, I think, this this applies, you know, kind of you've done the work related to Ridge Road. But in that package, there's a map, uh, a, a map with a hand drawn. Actually, Mike Plitt did this, and it's the flood prone homes, and you, you know for our grant proposal for the, the living shoreline, we took the 2017 document that was on Neal Estate and Breezy Point, and it said at that point, you know, it said there were this many flood prone homes. Well, this map that Mike drew was, you know, now there are this many flood prone homes, and it shows the roads and shows the homes. And so, I mean, I can, I can send it to you or Amalia can forward it over, but it's a, I mean, it's a pretty darn accurate depiction of, you know, what intersections or rut, what roads that have a slope, are you getting flooding? And right. there's, we got a fair number of pictures of those things. Again, because there's not a lot of discipline in the neighborhood, uh, they're not, you know, they're not making it to my coast, but um, anyway. Okay, thank you. Know, Okay, so I can, I can follow up directly with you on this. And Debbie's house was one that was featured in the pictures I sent yesterday, <laughs> by the way. Hey, my name is Mary. I'm from Solomon's. Um, I don't quite understand this elevation of our house. I understand there was a project or program that was going on where they said, they'd help us elevate our house up, but that doesn't solve our flooding problem. I, I don't understand why we would spend the money to put the house up when our land's gonna be gone. I, I don't understand. <laughs> that, yeah. You, you have to understand these are just tools to mitigate a hazard, so when you're talking about your land not being there, that's not necessarily just flooding. You're now talking about erosion issues. So you're talking about multiple different things all at once. This is just one tool in the toolbox that can help you. You're correct in that elevating your home doesn't make the water not arrive on your property. The flooding will still occur, but by elevating your structure, you're keeping your home, your property, and your life safe. It's elevated and dry, which is the reason that FEMA offers that. It won't make the flooding go away, but it will mitigate the hazard for your home. But getting to your home, you have to build decks and ladders and all kinds of stuff to get to it. Now you, you, you obviously would need access, and that's something you would be able to incorporate into that project. They wouldn't just put your house on stilts and tell you to <laughs> shimmy up a rope. <laughs> Sling a ladder. <laughs> <laughs> but, so you would, you would have... You need a driveway, you need a place to park, you need yep. a place to put your lawnmower, you yep. need... And that's actually one of the benefits of it, not a detraction. What a lot of people do, because most of our floodplain it also overlaps with the Chesapeake Bay critical area where you have limitations on lot coverage, the elevation of those homes actually ends up being a net benefit because most people, instead of going the minimum height up, they actually go high enough up that you can park under it. So you now have sheltered parking and storage. So a lot of people do do that because that, that ground level doesn't go away. 
it just can't be finished space. The lowest structural member of your home will be above the, uh, the base flood elevation. It will be at the free border higher. And so you now have covered parking that under critical area you may not have otherwise had. So again, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Nothing's going to be perfect, but it does, it does tend to help. And it is an option that a lot of people in the county have enjoyed. Yeah. yeah, it's like like Ron said, it's not a perfect solution. It's not going to stop the water from coming onto your property. But if you're looking at your home and your vehicle being flooded, wouldn't you rather just have your vehicle flooded? It's I mean, it's still not perfect. And we are aware of that. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot stop Mother Nature from doing what she's going to do. All we can do is try to be proactive in addressing these issues. And so, and we can try to provide resources to the residents. So we cannot stop the floods, but we can try to connect residents with resources to minimize their impact on their lives. We, and and that's, that's really where we're at right now. And we're always looking for new solutions. Yeah, Kara's exactly right. Flood proofing, making it so that it'll never happen simply isn't possible. Just like a bulletproof vest is not bulletproof, all, all our mitigation measures that we're talking about will not guarantee that a flood will never happen, but they will reduce the risk to loss of life and property. That's the whole reason for this document and for all the efforts that it will lead to is we want to make things better for the community. We can't prevent anything bad from ever happening, but we can make sure that if it, when it does, that it won't be as bad. My name is Ann Jones. Hey. Hi, Kara. <laughs> um, I'm in the old estate, and I am a recipient of the um, FEMA flood mitigation grant. And it's been nine years, but I think the building permit is in the final stages. <laughs> Kara, it's been amazing to work with. Um, but I, I guess this is just feedback or just a, hey, this is a challenge that I've had. Um, are you all working with the health department in giving, in like, th this has been my challenge. I had to get holding tanks, which is fine, um, but I was very concerned about my holding tanks being close to our seawall and the erosion and the, you know, the um, storm surges that occur and on a regular basis. So we had them installed, I think, end of August, and we've had three occasions where erosion has occurred, where the tanks are fully exposed and. I just worry, I know there's that 50 foot setback from wells, but I, you know, Calvert County is surrounded by water and waterfront property, I mean communities on small lots, and so I just feel like this is going to be a big issue. I pushed back with the health department and said this is hazardous to have holding tanks so close to the seawall and erosion. And he's, then they said, oh, let's just design something to go under your house spent tons of money designing something that wasn't feasible. I couldn't find anybody to build it because of, for a lot of reasons. So we ended up back behind the seawall. So my holding tanks are there, but we've had three flood events since August where they've been exposed and my next door neighbor, even worse so, and his were um, put in at the same time. So my, I guess my thought is, or my wonder is, um, is part of this plan going to take into account the exposure of brand new holding tanks that are going in to try to save the bay and follow the law, um, but they're really exposed and I'm just very concerned about that and I'm just thinking about going forward if the health department can consider, you know, changing the whole rule about these sealed holding tanks being closer to um, wells on these lots that are so small. So my current septic system is right next to my neighbor's well. I know that's not a good thing, but my sealed holding tanks would have been so much safer being right next to the road instead of out by the water and the wall. So it's just a little feedback. And I don't know, do you all work with the health department or will they see this plan? Yes, so as Kara said, one of our goals is to really increase the interdepartmental um, communication and coordination so we are all on the same page when these projects come to us. Um, environmental health was um, 
closely participating in the hazard mitigation plan update, mm -hmm. and they will see these updates and these notes. Um, and so that that is definitely something that will go into the plan and be addressed. Okay. So and thank I, you for your feedback. Though. And I appreciate that my coast, I did upload and that lower pictures are mine, but I, I appreciate that they do have a thing you check off if it um, impacts your septic. So that's great because I, I think you all are collecting Septic that is an issue in Calvert County. So yeah, it is. Yes, it's, it's, it's very nice that they're tracking that yeah. too. Yeah. It's been one that we've been recently having a lot of conversation about. And then also, Anne, just to your point, because I know you really went through quite an ordeal with those, septi with those uh, holding tanks. Ron, one of the things that is, was recently you and I discussed with the ordinance was the um, changes to permitting for projects like that. And yes. one of the proposed changes to try and cut through some of that red tape so that in the future, people don't experience what you went through with having to go through that cycle so many times and having it drag out for so long. So even though we don't have 100% solutions, we are still looking at at least trying to get to solutions faster. Okay. And, and I'm thinking of the future projects because I'm already yeah. done. But yeah, I know. I, mean, I know. I know it doesn't help you now. Yeah. But <laughs> we and I am thinking of others who might. Well, that is that is definitely a goal that we've had and will continue to work towards because we have to work with so many state, local, and federal requirements and so many different fingers in the pot, so to speak, that it does complicate things. But we are working towards and will continue to work towards streamlining that process, making it easier, and hopefully a little more common sense. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, and we do have a comment online. Um, a request for more information for homeowners on flood mitigation projects, as it is not an easy process for anyone in the county to get permitting for various flood mitigation on one's property, i.e. putting in gravel dirt to build up low levels on someone's proper property requires a permit and those are denied a lot. Any insight on how we as residents in the flood areas can take more initiative to protect our own and our property's safety. Um, Kevin, do you want to respond to that, or Ron? I think it'd be a That's team effort. I'll start it off yeah. with. <laughs> <Back and forth. laughs> it depends on necessarily what we're talking about, because it, it, a French drain or something similar is going to be different than elevating your property through fill. Elevating your property through fill, which is what I think that uh, question is getting at, is definitely a lot more difficult and is denied often because it takes a lot more. Like, it's not simply dumping dirt. You need to do a lot of engineering because, again, this will fall under FEMA regulations and they have a no adverse impact policy. You can't direct the floodwaters on to another property. I, I believe someone mentioned they wanted to do a seawall. That was one of those stumbling blocks with that. But it is absolutely still possible to do fill. You just need more engineering for it, and you need, need to do a letter of map amendment via fill with FEMA. So a process and a half, yes, but it is definitely doable, and you're more than welcome. I encourage you, please come to our office. Always happy to meet or to take calls if that's easier, and to try and uh, demystify the process. Like Ron was saying, it's, it is a process, and it's a process that not only involves the local county agencies, but you get involved with state agencies, you get involved with federal agencies, um, and Kara knows very well. I mean, once you get to the federal level, it takes a lot of effort to get through. Um, that being said, it's, if, if it's worth saving your property, it's worth trying. All right. I don't see any other comments online. Uh, excuse me, I have a question. Please. Here online. Uh, yes, my name is Penny Lander, and I live uh, down at Cove Point, but not in the floodplain. Um, I live off of uh, Beacon Way, uh, which is at the end of Cove Point Road to the right. We don't have tidal flooding, um, but uh, we do have the upland flooding that you were uh, referring to earlier when we have a significant rain event, uh, like on Sunday, uh, which makes this meeting very timely. And um, my, um, I'm, I'm on the HOA, and we certainly appreciate all the work you are doing. Clearly, you've got your work cut out for you. Um, so we have um, 
we have storm drains and we have ah pipes that go under the houses along the beach at cove point out into the bay and um ah to ah guide the water um away from the neighborhood as it rolls as it comes down the hill um and those pipes invariably build up with sand over time and maybe ah once every five to ten years the county comes out and removes the sand maybe extends the pipe because we do have quite a bit of accretion on our end of the beach um of sand the the beach is actually getting it ah ah wider every year for now um and now one storm can undo all that but um ah back in 2017 we had a serious problem with flooding at the end of beacon way ah the county came out they did a lot of um excavation and clearing of the pipe ah extending the pipe out into the bay and alleviating the problem ah for now we just had with this latest flooding on sunday um ah flood at beacon port i emailed amalia yesterday thank you um for responding amalia i uploaded to my coast yesterday also which i saw when you brought it up on the screen ah my pictures are there um we have a small cul-de-sac of about four houses and um the residents could not leave their house um their houses uh, since sunday um because the water is just too deep the county i i can't thank them enough i called ah uh, yesterday spoke to sarah in public works and um mr mr came out today with a team and a big truck that uh they pump the uh, 2000 gallons at a time and take it up to the uh uh dispose of it um in the uh, i guess uh wherever sewer water is disposed of um and i think they had to make a few trips uh but they're pumping the water out obviously there is a flood mitigation plan in or uh, flood mitigation in place with the pipes but clearly um the one under beacon court uh is uh, full of sand now and um it would be nice if because the county has gone to such a great expense to put those pipes in um but they only seem to be cleared out when we have an issue and i was just wondering if it was possible to get on some sort of a schedule um to have those inspected um on a more regular basis um uh, before there are tons and tons of sand that make it very difficult and expensive and timely to remove and i realize the county's resources are limited um in this regard i was just wondering uh, how familiar you are this is not the kind of flooding they get down at cove point uh they get the tidal flooding from from the bay from the from the back side we don't have that issue this is strictly an upland rain uh induced type flooding um but the pipes are there they just get blocked and it would be nice if uh if they could be inspected more regularly perhaps and cleared more regularly i don't know if that's in the plan or if that needs a specialized plan So hi this is Kevin okay. Shaver this is Kevin Shaver with Capital Projects Division. So about 4:30 this afternoon I was tasked by Director Cosgrove to come up with a permanent solution for the uh You guys are awesome. For the pipe I, at I Beacon. I love how responsive you've been. <laughs> so. Please thank Mr. Mr. Cosgrove and Mr. Mr. um you guys were on it uh within 24 hours and we certainly appreciate that. And what is your name again? It's Kevin Shaver, S H A V E R. And what department are you with? I'm with Public Works in the Capital Projects okay. Division. So feel free to reach okay. out to me at any time. Uh, I'll be working on your project. Oh, you guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um again, we had um four residents that couldn't leave their house. Um they didn't even feel safe uh, some of them going out in an SUV without a snorkel. on the car so um we we appreciate it thank you um i will probably reach out just to kind of put a name to the face uh based on the name and um 
thank you very much again. I, I realize you guys have your work cut out for you. Appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Have a good evening. We have a couple more comments online. Um, there is a question. So the name of where you upload the, the photos is called My, Ghost, My Coast Maryland. If you go to the Calvert County's floodplain management webpage, there is a badge. That's that little blue wave that you see down halfway down the page. Um, also, Terrell, can you flip back to the web page if you still have it opened? But it, it's mycoastmaryland.gov, I believe. Um, or if you just Google My Coast Maryland, it will pop up. But again, it is linked on our, on our, on our county floodplain management webpage. Um, we also have another question. If you elevate your home, do you still have to uh, carry flood insurance? The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. That would typically be a requirement of the grant that you keep the property within certain <coughs> conditions and insured. Uh, likewise, if you have a federally backed mortgage, even if you have not done an elevation grant, any federally backed mortgage for a property within the uh, mapped flood hazard area would be required to have insurance. And can I also add to that, if there's anybody listening that is interested in pursuing hazard mitigation funding for flood mitigation, you need to have flood insurance now. Not just because it's due diligence as a homeowner, but also because those uh, claims to your flood insurance create a story that, it creates a story, it creates a narrative that FEMA needs to see in order to validate those claims. So, um, Flood insurance is 100% a good idea if your home is anywhere close to flooding. Even if you don't live in the floodplain, it's not just for homes in the floodplain. And I'd add, not only does it, is it going to help your case with FEMA, but you, know, you, you need that as due diligence. And once you have elevated, you're going to get a better rate because your mitigation, by mitigating the hazard, you're at less of a risk. With your risk reduced, your rate's reduced. We also uh, work with uh, FEMO through the community rating system, which also lowers your rate. We're currently at a 10% uh, rate reduction, and we're working on getting that higher. So by participating in the community rating system and implementing higher standards, not just the bare minimum, we get you a rate reduction. So your rate is 10% lower than it otherwise would be. And we're looking at getting that rate continued to reduce by additional efforts. Find out about, it, it should be applied for any federal policy. So if you're insured through a private insurer, that's different, but if you were insured through the NFIP, it should be already be applied. Yeah, that's since it's a FEMA program and it's a FEMA insurance policy. It is supposed to come out. You should, it should, it should, it's not supposed to require any action on the part of the property owner. Yeah. So, so when we do um, the the flood mitigation plan update, the public outreach, um, protective measures in our zoning ordinance. Those measures show FEMA that we are taking a proactive stance at trying to mitigate damage and be responsible when it comes to preventing flood damage. So that makes us more appealing to insure. That gives us lower flood rate um, uh, uh, insurance premiums. So, and th that's applied countywide. So we, have, we currently have what's called a CRS rank of eight. We're trying to improve that and get to a six, and that would even further reduce um, flood insurance premiums. And just because I'm in Calvert County, Correct. Discount. Correct. If you have insurance through the NFIP. Um, Is that reflected on our bills? I would not be able to answer that question, but I would reach directly out to uh, your uh, insurer, basically to, uh, your point of contact for your policy. Um, I don't know whether it would be reflected on your bill, but if not, you should be able to get the information on it. We have a couple more questions online. Um, so one question is, what is the status of public water and sewer in the various red zone, red zone flood areas? Um, I've seen pl plans for Cove Point, but they seem to be continuously postponed. That is a great question. Um, as, as we mentioned, um, septic in Calvert County is an issue, and we are working to address it and, and come up with solutions. The plans for Cove Point per se, I'm not familiar with, um, but we can certainly look into that and 
If you, Rudell, if you would um, give me your contact information, um, I can certainly look into that and get back to you on that. Uh, we also have a question about, oops. Is there a resident step-by-step -step guide for getting FEMA, FEMA funding for a home to be raised? We don't have a step-by-step -step guide, but we do have Kara Buckmaster. <laughs> <laughs> She's better than any step-by-step -step guide you can get. <laughs> if you go on to Emergency Management's website, there is a page there that talks about mitigation grants for residents. On there, there is a homeowner guide to elevation and acquisition. I will warn you, those documents were um, ones that we were given from the state. They have not been updated in a very long time, so they look a little antiquated, but the essence of what's in those documents remains the same. I've also tried to provide a ton of information on that website to connect residents to more information. It is a it's a lot. I mean, Anne can tell you it's it's a lot, and it takes a long time, and it re requires a lot of documentation. Um, it's a highly technical process, but there are now two. It used to just be me, but now there's two of us in my office who uh, manage these grants, and one of them, Stacy, that is her her entire job, and we the reason we hired her is because we recognized that there was an increasing need. For this assistance for homeowners and uh, so that's you know what we do is try to assist homeowners with identifying these grants and applying for them um, the grant has to run through the county to the state to FEMA that is not something we can go around you as a homeowner cannot apply apply by yourself you have to apply through the county and we apply on behalf of you um, it does have a cost share. That is something you should be aware of. A lot of that information is on our website. And of course, my contact information is on there and Stacy's contact information is on there. And if you go to that page, um, at the bottom is a form, that, a survey that you can fill out and submit to us and our office receives a copy of that. And then we can review your application and discuss your options with you and talk about competitiveness. Um, to that point, something you all should be aware of also is that these grants are competitive nationwide, which means that it's not just within the state of Maryland, it's within the entire country and it's in the US territories. And um, there is never enough funding to go around. The BRIC program allocated uh, $1 billion in funding this year, but you'll probably they'll probably see well over six billion in requests for funding. So it's important to make your application as competitive as possible, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier about flood insurance. Making sure you have it, you keep it, you're tracking all of your flood reports. Also, um, repetitive loss and severe repetitive loss get a major advantage. So. If you are repetitive loss or severe repetitive loss and we can document that, that helps too. Um, but it is something you should be aware of that if you want to pursue these, it takes a lot of time, it takes a pretty big investment, and it's not guaranteed because it is competitive. Um, but of course, you know, my staff were here, we're, this is what we're working on, and if you are interested, please go to the website and read through that information, fill out the form, and reach out to us and we can try to answer the questions you have. So another question online. What flood mitigation projects can residents do that do not require permitting in these low level areas like Cove Point? The red tape of the county is going to start putting residents in danger during flooding. Would rec and um, they'd recommend developing any kind of flood mitigation ideas for residents to do themselves and clearly outline what we, what we do and do not need permits regarding flooding. The short answer is any development projects in those flood areas require permits, and that is part of the federal program that we participate in. So in order to get these reduced flood insurance rates, we have to show FEMA that we are taking these actions. And one of those minimum standards is requiring permits for any development in um, a special flood hazard area. 
and I mean, when we talk to FEMA, they're like, if you put a mailbox up, you need to get a, a permit. And, and that does sound extreme. However, it's, it's important because if those structures, there are cases, you know, people put a swing set up, well, what can it do? Well, that swing set, if there's a flood area, and that comes down, that starts collecting debris, the debris breaks loose, and then you have flooding that rushes through and, and damages property downstream. So when you're talking about that flood area, it's really a holistic look that you're looking at all adjacent properties and how the development on that one piece of property can affect the, 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 the baseline elevation and the flooding that occurs during an event. Yeah. And it's not even, we can't blame FEMA for everything. We can blame the state a little too. <laughs> it, it's, all these areas are going to almost always overlap with uh, the critical area as well and it's in Comar, it's in it's state law, pretty much anything you do in those areas is going to require a permit. It, it's just the nature of these sensitive areas, whether it's sensitive for environmental reasons or sensitive due to a hazard, they want us to monitor what's going on and to make sure everything meets minimum standards to again mitigate risks. Any other questions? If I'm missing any online, please raise your hand. I got one other quick, really quick one. Of course. Um, yeah, so, well, you know, since there's a group of us here, um, so w how can we help you help us between now and the publication of the dra release of the draft plan? Right, because today's meeting was to talk about, you know, maybe specific problems that we're residents have, and that that meeting's what about a month from now. So what 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 can we do as a collective to uh, help you that might help us in terms of the what's in the plan? Sure. So so this meeting the the. As, as you correctly stated, the main point is to hear your concerns and get, and get feedback to make sure that we are, are hearing what's happening in the county correctly. Um, then we're going to take this back, integrate it into our plan with our data. Again, those data sets, I know it seems cold and, and not uh, you know, relevant or accurate, but as Ron mentioned, th three centimeters is, um, is pretty accurate. <laughs> um, so, so we take the human, <coughs> excuse me, the human element and the data analysis, and we pair them together and we create this, this plan. And then at the January 18th meeting, we will release the, the draft. Um, as soon as it's ready to be released, it will be released online, but at the January 18th um, meeting, we'll go through it and show these are the hazards, these are the mitigation, um, potential mitigation projects, this is how we've prioritized them. And so then, then again, we're gonna solicit your feedback does this accurately reflect the concerns, the mitigation priorities? Um, you know, what are your questions and concerns on that draft? Once that draft is, is finalized, then it goes to BOCC for approval, and then it will go up to the state for approval to enable us to get further funding. And then that's the plan that we will act on updating. So every year we file, um, what is the official name of that status report? Are you talking about for CRS? Yes. Yeah, er, uh, every year we have to report to FEMA. It is our annual recertification for the CRS program where we provide them our continuing outreach efforts, our copies of all our mailers that go out to people within the floodplain, along with statuses of our plans, statuses of our ordinance, and any number of other documents, along with uh, documentation for all of our permits within the Special Flood Hazard Area because they make sure that we administer those to a minimum standard that's actually a standard of 95% uh, accuracy. We, we can only have 5% have an error. And because of the volume that we have is not as high, it, it really ends up being 100%. 100% of homes typically have to have absolutely no errors on even a single portion of the paperwork or the design or the construction. And so, and so then that will reflect the, the work. Yeah, yes. Quick question. Is there a deadline to get all the photographs up to this site before you complete your reporting or analysis, or is that just ongoing information? I don't know what you said. Yeah, so I would say, because um, yeah, we're looking at the 18th to have the draft plan to be presented. So I would say um, 
likely a week before that just to make sure that anything that comes in we'd want to make sure that we have so we can get that report that's december you're talking about well if it's Which the 18th like i would say the 11th of january january 11th yeah. january okay yeah. all right yeah. thank you and, and just I, real quick from a yeah, county my, gis yeah, my question perspective was, do we need, like, should we have an all-out list <laughs> Yeah. Well, and we certainly we do have flyers, and um, if you contact me, I can I can provide outreach. If, if you know there's communities um, groups or civic groups uh, that that you feel should be contacted, we d certainly want to hear from them as well. And Sierra, oops, sorry, Sierra, Sierra first. yeah, uh, just from a community GIS or county GIS standpoint, everything you guys are contributing to that app builds our historic database of information, which feeds this future modeling. Um, it just builds additional information. This is not a one-time effort. This is continued. Whatever you do upload now is continuously taken in. So don't think this three-week sprint is all that we need from you guys. Um, community involvement, super important because our models are great, but uh, the historic is how we validate, right? What's actually happening compared to what we said would happen. Um, thanks, Amalia. Yeah. Yep, Sierra said exactly what I was thinking. After this three-week period is done, after this plan is done, don't stop. The data will continue to have value and continue to be utilized in future plans. So by all means, please continue to participate and to utilize it. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out. My business cards are out at the front desk, and there's also flyers for my coast. And I just wanted to mention we do have a survey on our website um, for, it's a five minute survey. And, and again, it's just asking where do you live, where do you experience flooding, and how frequently do you experience that flooding? Um, so I encourage you all to, to participate in that survey. There's a flyer um, that, that gives the website there. And I will put it in the chat for the folks online as well. And please get home safely. And thank you so much for participating. Thank you.